Well, welcome everybody to Meet the Experts. I'm Katie Wolfson, Science Education Specialist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Uh, and one of the really amazing parts of working for NCAR is that there are so many different types of jobs that you can have. Um, you can be a scientist, you can be a researcher, you can be a engineer, a pilot, a machinist, you can be a computer specialist, uh, you can be a chef, a safety expert, you can be an educator like Tim and I. Um, there are so many amazing jobs that you can do here. And Meet the Experts is our chance to connect you to those experts and all of those amazing jobs. So every other week, we hop on here and we do a Q&A with experts um, from NCAR. And today we have not one, but two amazing experts for you to talk to. Uh, we are so excited to go behind the scenes at the NCAR Wyoming Supercomputing Center in Cheyenne, Wyoming today. Um, and before we do that, a couple quick housekeeping things. I want to ask everybody to please keep your camera off and keep your microphone muted just so we can minimize disruptions and interruptions in the program. But we would love, love, love to hear your questions in the chat. So go ahead and type in the chat um, any questions you have throughout the program. We'll have time for questions at the end too, but if you see something cool or hear something cool that pops up, makes you wonder something, write it in the chat and we'll be watching. Um, also, if you need any support with anything, type in the chat for us. Um, all right. So with that, I think we have some amazing people to talk to today. I have the pleasure of introducing you to Jeanette Tillotson and Ben Matthews, who are systems engineers. Uh, and I would love to turn it over to them. And Jeanette, could you tell us a little bit more about what a supercomputer is and what it means to be a systems engineer? Sure. All right. So thanks, Katie. Um, so hi, I'm Jeanette Tillotson and me and Ben Matthews here. We're systems engineers at NCAR. And so I'm going to first start with what is a supercomputer? So a supercomputer is uh, several computers uh, tied together with a fast network. So that allows the computers to be used as one big computer. So if you think of something like a uh, that would take 30 days, there are lots of things that take a long time to process. So it would take 30 days to run on one computer. If you had perfect scaling, you could run that same thing on 30 computers in one day. So it makes, it allows us a supercomputer. The reason it's super is because it allows us to run uh, things much quicker and get answers back much sooner. Uh, the supercomputers also, it's not just the compute nodes or the network, it's also a file storage system uh, that we use for you know, storing data and the facility that houses the machine. All four of those things go into a supercomputer. So at NCAR, we use supercomputers to do things like weather forecasting, which is what you all, the weather forecasts that you see on your television are done with supercomputers. Uh, we also do wildfire forecasting. So that will say where like wildfires might spread. Uh, we, what, we model weather. So we uh, do like tornadoes, they'll take tornado measurements, and then they'll come back to the computer and model it on the computer. So that, that way they can use the model to learn things. And of course, NCAR does climate modeling. So we model the climate out hundred years and that helps us know, you know where our world is and what kinds of things we need to change to improve our climate. So, um, so Ben and I were systems engineers. So we manage the compute and that file storage system in, in, in other things um, for uh, NCAR, but we're not just like a computer person. That's not the only thing we do. We also do things with like water. We're plumbers sometimes. We do things with electricity. So sometimes we're electricians, sometimes we're mechanics. We take things apart, screw them back together. So there's all sorts of things that go into our jobs. And that's one of the things I like the best about it is that there's just so many different aspects to it. I, I don't ever get bored. Um, always new problems too. So that, that keeps this job interesting. Um, both Ben and I, we have master's degrees in computer science, but you don't need a, a computer degree to do this job. Um, you don't need a degree at all. In fact, I work with several people in this field that don't even have a college degree at all. It certainly makes it easier to get started in the field, but it's not necessary. Um, other things I like about this job is we set our own hours. Um, as long as we get our work done, uh, we can pretty much work anytime we want. So some people work like noon to 8 p.m. at night because that fits better for them. Some people work uh, different, like they'll work some in the morning and then they might take a break and then they might work some in the evening. So it's very flexible in the hours that we work. We also have a lot of freedom and independence in our job. We, we are just kind of told broadly what we're supposed to do and then we determine what, how to do that job. 
So it's a lot of uh, figuring out problems, a lot of problem solving and a lot of independence in that regard. And the reason I mention all this is because we need more supercomputing systems engineers. Uh, there's a big shortage of them. So if you're interested in a job like this, if this sounds exciting, I, I encourage you to go check out jobs in systems engineering, particular for supercomputing. So um, I'm gonna show you some examples of some supercomputers. There is a list, let me share my screen here. Oh, let's see. Oh, now, now, now it's, all, it's all, why does it do this to me? <laughs> I had it all set up, ready to just click, and now I got to find it. How does this happen? All right. Why can't I find it? There it is. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Unfortunately, it looks like it's just a search bar for us. Tonight. It. All right. Let's try it again. Yeah. When I went to do the sharing. <laughs> it worked beautifully yeah. before. <laughs> it did something strange. So let's try it again. Oh, that looks uh, better. There it is. We can there we go. That. All right. Great. Yeah. So I think I had maybe a little search bar up in this and that's why it would be confused uh, Zoom. So apologize. All right. So this is a list of the top 500 fastest supercomputers in the world. Um, and so you can see here this, the top machine, the fastest supercomputer in the world is a supercomputer called Fugaku. It's in Japan and it has 7,630,000 processors in it. So this is, uh, it's, you can think of that as like 7 million or 7.6 million computers that it can tie all together. And it runs at 442,000 and this is T for teraflops. A flop is a mathematical calculation. And so Fugaku can do 442,000 teraflops or, or tera is a trillion mathematical calculations a second. So that's a lot of calculations. Um, you see this other number here, this is the theoretical speed of Fugaku. That's that, when I talked earlier, if we had exact scaling, if everything scaled exactly, this, it, we would get this kind of speed out of it, but it doesn't. So it's not quite as fast as it, as it can be. It's measured that fast. So we, they've actually ran a program on Fugaku that actually did that many calculations a second. Um, and then the other thing over here you see is the power that Fugaku uses. It uses almost 30,000 kilowatts, a kilo being a thousand. So it uses 30,000 kilowatts or 30 megawatts, a mega being a million. So we all know kilo is a thousand, right? Mega is a million, giga is a billion, tera is a trillion. So those things will come up as we talk about these more today. Um, and then this is Fugaku. This is a, a picture of Fugaku. You can see, I couldn't find a complete picture of Fugaku, but you can see it's rows and rows and rows and rows of super of computers. Each in here, there's several lots, like a hundred probably computers in this one cabinet here. And this cabinet is about the size of a refrigerator. So you can imagine how large this computer is. I mean, it takes up a massive room, bigger than your house. Um, and, and that's how it, it, it's getting that speed that we talked about by having all of those computers that it can bring to bear. Uh, the second one here is Summit. This is a computer that, that's actually in, in Tennessee, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and it's got 2.4 million processors and it runs at 200 or 201,000 teraflops or mathematical calculations a second. And it uses 10,000 kilowatts or 10 megawatts of power. And here's Summit, here's a picture. Of, this is the Summit page. And they have a lovely little walkthrough if you want to check out later of their supercomputing center. And so you can see this is Summit. It's just heat, long rows all the way back here. And then rows and rows and rows and rows and rows of supercomputers, of, of computers, right? That all make up this one supercomputer. And then there's another computer that's called Mare Nostrum. Let's find it on here. I bring it up just because it's in Spain. It's in Barcelona, Spain. Um, excuse me one second. I guess that happens to everybody. 
I know it. And I got a cat too. The cat will event probably walk across the table at some point. I apologize. Anyway, so we have Mary Nostrum. It's a computer in Barcelona, Spain. Again, it's 153,000 processing units and it runs at 6.4 thousand trillion, right? Uh, uh, Mathematical operations. I want to say flops all the time. So, but I don't want to confuse you with that term. It's just really a mathematical calculation. I mean, it's 42nd on the list and it's this computer here. It actually is housed in a church in uh, Barcelona there. It's beautiful, it's in this glass room. And again, you see just rows and rows, right? Of, there's like five rows here and goes all the way back. You know, you just computer after computer. Again, each one of these racks probably holding around a hundred computers. And then the last one of course is the one we run, which is Cheyenne. And that's down here at 60th. It's the 60th fastest supercomputer in the world. That's what we run here at NCAR. And that's what Ben and I, uh, that's what we maintain. And um, it's 145,000 uh, processing units and it runs at 4.8, uh, again, thousand trillion mathematical calculations a second. And you all saw a picture of Cheyenne. This is Cheyenne. This is just one row of Cheyenne. It's actually, this is two rows. Cheyenne is this row, and then there's another row of Cheyenne. So it's about twice the size of this. Again, each one of that, like that E, that's about the size of a refrigerator, a very large refrigerator to be exact. Um, and so, um, so Cheyenne, I wanted to compare Cheyenne. We wanna show you a note of Cheyenne. We're gonna, we've taken a note of Cheyenne out. Actually, it's a blade of Cheyenne. Each blade has four nodes on it and Ben's gonna show you that, but I wanna show you a computer that I have here in my house. So this is a, an HP Pavilion. I'm sure you've, this is kind of a computer you might have in your house or in your school or in the library. Um, and it's, uh, we're gonna open it up here. Let's take a look inside of it. So a lot of you might've seen these before. This was pretty, pretty common computer. It's actually a pretty old one to be exact. And um, in this computer, this is the processor right here. And you can see it's got a big cooling block on it. Underneath this fan is a big, huge piece of metal. That's a cooling block. And then there's this fan that we use to cool it. So this is the cooling for this computer. Um, it's got some memory in here. There's a four gigabyte memory chip in here. Again, giga being a billion, right? So got 4 billion bytes of memory there. It also has a, the power supplies down here. This is a 220 watt power supply. Um, and the other thing is it's got networking on it. It's got um, a Wi-Fi networking, which is running at 600 megabits a second. Again, mega being a million, so 600 megabits a second. And uh, so, yeah, let's take a look at a Cheyenne node and see how that compares. Ben, you wanna, you wanna take it from here? I'm sorry, Jeanette. Uh, we have a uh, on-site tech support guy here that was distracting us. When you have a system this large, it turns out that you know you might see a failure in your computer maybe once a year, once every couple of years. But we have 4,000 computers here, so we see a failure pretty much every week, maybe three or four or five. So there's quite a maintenance load. Anyway, um, we have here a Cheyenne blade. This is sort of the equivalent of four of the machine Je uh, Jeanette showed you, but it's a little bit smaller. Um, so we can unfold it and we can see sort of the same components. Um, some of the components that Jeanette's computer has are shared among many of these blades, but the general, general design is the same. Uh, each, this each of these boards is two computers like you would have at home. Each one has two processors instead of one, uh, 36 cores each. Um, we have memory modules, and these memory modules are very similar to what you'd have in any other computer. Uh, we have some network cards. These are a lot faster than anything you'd have at home. So each of these network cards is 100 gigabits a second. It's about 100 times what you might have from a very good internet connection at home, um, maybe 10 times that from a typical internet connection. Um, each of these nodes also has a management computer on it in the back on the back plane. 
Uh, this allows us to turn the node off and on, do some diagnostics. Uh, this is important because Jeanette and I and the rest of the team uh, work from Boulder, Colorado, and yet this hardware is located in Wyoming, in Cheyenne, Wyoming. The main reason for that is availability of power and cooling. Uh, it's hard to get enough power to run one of these systems in a really dense urban environment. Um, another interesting thing about these, they don't actually have any storage. There's an optional place to plug in storage, but uh, we don't have storage on these nodes. So they're all booted over the network. All their data comes from the network. The reason for that is to make them easier to maintain. If you're interested in how we do storage here at NCAR, uh, feel free to ask our Meet the Experts moderators or put a comment in the chat and uh, we can talk about that at another date. Um, Jeanette pointed out how large these systems can get. So it's very important to pack as many of these nodes in as small a space as possible. So these nodes actually fold and you might be able to see that the two boards are a little bit different and each of the components is kind of offset. Um, so that's, that's how we get as many boards as we do in as small a space as we do. Um, these nodes are water cooled. So uh, each of the CPUs is on a water, a water loop and you can see the water comes in a quick connector and runs over the processors. And if you've taken a physics class, you might know that water can draw heat away from a surface much more effectively than air. So Jeanette's one low power computer uses a big fan. Here we have water and the big fans are outside in the parking lot uh, evaporating water for us. Um, so when this slides into the, into the, into the rack, uh, there are a set of quick disconnects on the back. So we have a water intake and a water output, uh, network connectors, power connectors, and this big metal uh, pin that ensures that the node is aligned in the right place so that when we slide these nodes in and out, these connectors don't get damaged. That's pretty important. Um, so this is four nodes, right? This node came from in here and it's gonna be a little loud when I open this door, so I apologize for that. We can see that's where the node that I just showed you came from. Each of these racks has four enclosures. Each enclosure has 36 nodes on these blades. Um, and the nodes share a lot of resources. For example, these power supplies are shared among all the nodes in their enclosure. We have an enclosure of nodes Shared power supplies. Um, you saw there were some components like emery that aren't water cooled, but we have these big blowers on the side that cool any component that's not on the water loop. If we come around to the side of this rack, um, this system is, uh, is water cooled and it uses basically a big swamp cooler that you might have at home. Same idea, it's, it's very inexpensive to evaporate water and you can move a lot of energy that way. But in order to evaporate water, we have to have the water exposed to the outside and it can potentially get dirty, you know, bugs in it, whatever. So we can't have that going through the computers. So we have a heat exchanger and a series of pumps that pump very, very clean treated water through the computers and uh, exchange heat with a still very clean, but less clean outside water loop. Uh, you can see kind of, I always think this is funny. We've got basically your hiking water bag um, to fill up if there are any leaks in the computer. And we've actually had some leaks here. You know, Jeanette mentioned we're plumbers too. Uh, there's quite a lot of water moving through the system at any given time. We walk around to the back of one of these racks. We can see all the networking infrastructure. So these network switches are a technology called InfiniBand. Each one of these cables is about a hundred times what a cable you might have at home would be able to move in terms of data. So longer cables are optical. So there's a laser in the connector that sends data to the fiber. Uh, some of the shorter links uh, use regular copper wires, but you notice these are pretty, pretty hefty wires and that's because of the amount of data that's being moved and you need them to be electrically quiet. Um, each of the enclosures also has a specialty controller, and this allows us to do diagnostics and turn on and off any misbehaving components. Uh, again, we're, we're all remote, so it's very important that we be able to administer these systems remotely. Uh, there are a couple of people on site here that can do hardware work, but uh, 
those of us on the main engineering team generally only come up here when something breaks or when we're de deploying a new system. Um, and of course, all these computers, Jeanette's computer was about 200 watts. Each one of these nodes is about twice that, but this rack has about 100 of those nodes. So you can imagine how much power is needed. And you can see that the power cables that feed this rack are just massive, about the size of my hand. Yeah, looking um, at Cheyenne, it looks like it, it, we have 1.7 thousand kilowatts. So it's 1.7 megawatts is what we have, what's on the top 500 page for and, power. And the, the amount of power this, a system like this consumes varies quite a bit by what it's doing. So we've actually pulled close to two megawatts with this system, but only with benchmarks that are very, very efficient. So the one, one and a half to 1.7 um, is about where it runs normally. Um, so yeah, what he means by efficient too, what he means is like, we run special codes to see how fast this computer is. So we really run it on very, it's a very simple kind of uh, math that we're doing. It's not that complicated. It's just a lot of them. So we just make the computer do a lot of those mathematical calculations all at one time. And if we can do that and do it in a special way, we can max the computer out if you want to think of it that way. But normally Cheyenne doesn't run at max power. Uh, because, you know, the, the people using it don't use it the most efficiently, right? They're doing work uh, that's important to them. They're not trying to get the most out of the supercomputer. They're just trying to get their work done. So we don't tend to run it at the max, you know, that Cheyenne can do. It's sort of like putting your car on a dynamometer. You know, you run at the maximum amount of horsepower for a period of time just to see what it can do. But you would never run that way in in the real world, you'd have stoplights and traffic and whatever that make you prevent you from running at full blast all the time. Right. It's the you're same thing to get to the grocery. <laughs> yeah, sorry. You're trying to get to the grocery store, right? You're not trying to get there, you know, the fastest you possibly can. So that's the idea. Same, that's the analogy. Yeah. And each of these lasers and the switches also produces a ton of heat. So you can see they're water cooled as well. There's a manifold in here that distributes water from the rest of the, from those pumps we showed you. Um, we Into actually have a track. question, um, Ben and Jeanette, we have a question for you about the water. Um, our folks in Lakewood are wondering how much water does the system use and is it reused somehow? Um, the water in these racks is reused because it's very clean. Uh, I'm not sure the exact number, but it's, it's only a few gallons, like five to 10 gallons in each group of four racks. So we have 28 of these racks. You can figure out what the total is yourself there. Um, in terms of the outside water system, like I said, it's a swamp cooler. So we, ev we evaporate a huge amount of water and use that phase change to take energy out of the system. And the amount of water that is involved with that is going to depend on the load on the system, um, how dry the air is outside, a lot of variables. But it's on the order of thousands of gallons a day. So these systems are not that great for the environment in some sense, right? We're using a lot of power, we're using a lot of water. On the other hand, the research it's doing is hopefully going to help us save the environment. So it's yeah. worth it. Yeah. So I also, I also saw a question about the previous fastest supercomputer. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here again really quick if that's okay. I see now what's going on with this. Uh -huh. Now I know what screwed up my share thing before, so. You're seeing a systems engineer at work already problem solving. I know it. And, and like, you'd think we could operate computers better. <laughs> but so we struggle with them just like everybody else. So this top 500 list, you can go back and look at previous lists. They have them all the way back. So like if you want, if you're interested, you can go back all the way to when they first did the list, which was in 1990, June of 1993. So... The fastest computer then was at Los Alamos, which is in New Mexico. And um, it had 1,024 cores, right? Remember Cheyenne's like, what, 4.7 million? This has 1,024 cores. And it ran at 59 gigaflops, billion, 59 billion floating point operations a second. Isn't that, that's way, right? We're already in the teraflops. We're, we've been talking about teraflops with all these, that's a trillion, this is a gigaflop, a billion. So you can go back and look at all of the past computers if you want, all the previous lists, uh, if you're interested. 
So we can we replace one of these systems every three to five years because after five years, the newest system on the market will typically be so much faster that you burn roughly half the power to get the same amount of compute load. And it's just so much cheaper to run a new one, buy a new one every couple of years. Uh, so there's a new top 500 list every year that has a new set of rankings. I believe Cheyenne, the system started right around the 20th, 20th fastest system. And the list I was looking at showed it around 60. 60, it's at 60, yeah. And so that's, like you can see here- In three years. Yeah, Ch China actually had the fastest computer for a while. And they, they have a lot on the top 500, China does. And they these are fancy machines that they built. They engineered them themselves, which is really cool. We bought ours from um, HPE or SGI at the time, which was acquired by HPE, but we bought it from a company. They, they put it together for us and built it. But a lot of these Chinese machines, they build them themselves. So if you have an interest in like computer engineering, there's all sorts of jobs out there for actually just building these things and actually engineering them from the chip on up. So. Very cool. Uh, ben and Jeanette, I have a question for the two of you. Um, yeah. I am wondering, we're talking about all these supercomputers and I think the two of you are pretty super also. And I'm wondering, do you consider, are there any superpowers that you feel like you and Ben have that help you do your job really well? Like what's something about um, something that you think you're really great at that does really well as a systems engineer? I'll, I'll let Ben take that. You want to take that, Ben? I would say the, uh, the biggest thing is the ability to understand a very complex system like this and guess where the problems are going to be or infer where the problems are going to be. Like I said, we buy a new one of these every few years. By the time we get it working, it's just about ready to be decommissioned a lot of times. And these are very, very new technology. Every time we get a new system, there, there will be something wrong with it. It never fails. So the ability to understand how it works, how each, where each of those cables goes, how everything's connected together, and look at what, what kind of problem you're experiencing and your understanding of the system and determine what is most likely wrong and then go try to prove that, you know, scientific method, right? Mm -hmm. make, make a hypothesis and then try to show whether that is or is not the cause of your difficulty. Yeah, I, I'd uh, say- That's the biggest thing. Yeah, a detective. I, I liken my work to a detective a lot. So there'll be like some problem and you, you, nobody's ever seen it ever. You're off, sometimes the first person to have ever seen this problem before and you got to figure out what it is and fix it. That's your job. So, uh, so that's why it's always new and changing, but it's like being a detective. You have to kind of go out, you gather evidence, you make a hypothesis, you, then you go out and look for that. And, and so I, I think that's the most important thing, like problem solving, um, being able to uh, think outside the box, look at things broadly. Um, so very much like being a detective. Every one of these systems is unique. You know, SGI might've sold a dozen or so systems based on this technology to various sites, but only we have one this size with this, these cooling uh, parameters, you know, this exact equipment. So yeah. it's not like you can just go Google a problem. You have to actually figure out what's going on. Exactly and, and like, like being a detective. Yeah, I've, I've, I've uh, touched machines that were, had serial number three, meaning it was the third thing like it in the world. So, and the other two were just delivered the day before probably, right? So again, I run into problems and it's like, I, where do you don't go? You, you can go back to the vendor and the vendor will work with you. Of course, they understand the system and stuff, but sometimes there are problems they don't even understand. We, we run into problems that the vendors can't even solve. And then we work with the vendor back and forth. We will often help them and provide them stuff to help improve their equipment. So it's very cutting edge. You we saw me get distracted earlier in this call. That was the vendor for Cheyenne asking me for help. <laughs> happens all the time. Yep. Wonderful. We have another question from Lakewood um, saying the computers are so neat and organized. It's amazing. How many people work on the maintenance of the computers on site? We have traditionally we have about four on site at any given time, but it's been cut down to closer to two or three during the pandemic. Um, we have someone from the company that made it show up about twice a week to replace parts. So Part of the reason why they're so neat and tidy is to make it very efficient to service. Um, we have thousands of cables in this room running all over the place. And if they weren't immaculately you know, dressed, 
put up in the cable trays, Jared, if you want to show the cable trays in the ceiling. If everything weren't just so, you'd never be able to service it because you'd never be able to find the particular thing that's broken. You probably so, also break things too. By not having it be neat, you'll break things. And again, this, there's a lot of little niggly parts that all have to be working. So you have to be very careful not to you know, introduce issues. You already have enough to deal with with having such a large thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Those cables I showed, those are glass inside. They're a very tiny, less than a millimeter diameter piece of glass. So if you just try to pull those to untangle them, you'll break them. And those, those cables are about $1,000 a piece if you were to go buy one you know, on the open market. And they're that expensive because they're so special. And they're very fast. We are getting close to the end of our program. So if our uh, folks in the chat have any other questions, please definitely let us know. Um, while we're seeing if anyone else has any final questions, I want to ask Ben and Jeanette, uh, when you were in middle school and high school, did you like computers too? Or were you into other things? I, I tell that story that when I was in the seventh grade, the first personal computer came out, the one that you could actually buy for your house. I'm old, so <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, and I remember touching it for the very first time and thinking, I don't, this is it, I wanna do this. So I knew from the seventh grade on that this was my career. I was gonna do something in computing. Um, I didn't think about doing a, being an a HPC systems engineer or supercomputing en systems engineer until um, I was just working as a regular systems administrator. I was running a mail server for um, a university and uh, the opportunity came up to go work in a visualization center and they had a small cluster. And so I kind of fell into it that way. And once I got involved with that, then the, the supercomputing group at Purdue where I was working uh, convinced me to go work for them. So that's how I got into it. Not sure about Ben, how'd you get into it, Ben? I am pretty similar. I started a little younger than you did, I think. Um, I was probably, three, four, five, something like that when my parents first brought home a computer and, you know, same thing, fun to play with, right? That said, um, a lot of people in, in our fields actually kind of get sucked into this through some other field. You know, maybe you're a, a climate scientist, right? And you need some compute resources. Maybe your university has a small cluster, but nobody's really maintaining it or paying attention to it. So it's pretty easy to start off with some domain science, need resources, you know, go fix the resources that you might already have lying around. And then that accidentally turns into a career. I'd say probably half our team is in that boat. And it's, yeah. it's very common. Uh, we have, so we have don't a biologist. necessarily have to start out with computing. Right. We have a biologist in our group. He, he has a biology degree. I think he has a master's. Does he start with a master's in biology? I think he might have a master's, but he's, he's, he's I, a I biologist. He yeah, he's a biologist. So. And I know and, music, a lot of music majors that are in English majors that are in this field. Yeah. And to pick on our biologist colleague, he got started exactly that way. He was working at the University of Wyoming and he needed compute resources. So he went and built a cluster and then got good at doing cluster things. And now he works on clusters all the time. Yeah. So I know, I know an astrophysicist that now does supercomputing you know, systems work. Uh, and he was a he has a PhD in astrophysics, and he was the same way. He used supercomputers to model, I think it was galaxy collisions, and he loved it so much that he ended up just changing careers. And now he's a now he does systems work. Climate is certainly not the only field these systems are used for. Um, astrophysics is big, biology is big. Um, I've got a younger brother who's doing some literary research with supercomputers right now, trying to analyze old writing. So it's really all over the place in terms of use. NCAR focuses on climate, but um, other supercomputer centers are more diverse. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Ben and Jeanette. I think we are about at time today. Um, I'd love to invite our folks watching that if you want to see more supercomputer uh, programs like this, uh, there is a ton more that Jeanette and Ben and their team could show us. Um, so if you would love to see more Meet the Experts exploring our supercomputing center, let us know in the chat. We would love to hear about that. And maybe we can see that on some future Meet the Experts, meet more supercomputer experts. Um, 
In the meantime, we want to also invite you to join us. Um, Meet the Experts is a program that happens every other week. And so we will be doing another Meet the Experts on April 15th. Stay tuned on our website for what that one is going to be about. Uh, but April 15th is our next day. Um, and in the meantime, if you want to explore more about how Cheyenne and our supercomputers are used, um, we have some Meet the Experts that we've done previously that you can go back and watch and you can see the, how those supercomputers are used. Um, some good ones to look for that might be what are data visualizations made of, science, art, and video games as a previous one. We also have improving models and forecasts, hurricanes edition, zooming in on future hurricanes, and raising the alert, improving predictions of severe thunderstorms. Um, I think even another one that's probably going to get posted soon, our last one was about predicting wildfires. Um, so there's all sorts of ways that these amazing supercomputers are used. Um, and so go ahead and check out some of those Meet the Experts, maybe with this new lens of what is going on behind the scenes to make all of that happen. Um, and also, maybe you'll find some other Meet the Experts or other places in your life when you're looking at science and research um, that you're like, oh, maybe a super supercomputers behind this. Um, so thank you so, so much, Ben and Jeanette. Um, thank you everybody for attending and asking your questions. I see Leanne is saying, group is saying, thank you so much. I can't believe how many times we said, wow, it was so fun. We really enjoyed learning about this supercomputer. Um, I did too. I know Tim did too. Um, it was so much fun to get to go behind the scenes with all of you. Um, so we hope to see everybody on a future Meet the Experts. Um, and in the meantime, have a wonderful day. And thank you so much, Ben and Jeanette. Yeah, thanks everybody for listening too. And thanks, Katie, for organizing yeah, it. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.